The subject that we're going to be looking at today is the promise of the Holy Spirit. And I've got a secondary title, When the Days Are Filled. When the Days Are Filled. I know this, and, and there are a bunch of things that I don't know. <laughs> there are a bunch of things I don't know. They've written the books about what I don't know, and many of them. But, uh, but I do know this, that God knows. And God's in complete control. His timetable's right on schedule. Nothing new is happening that's going to surprise Him. He's got it all under control. Well, today as we're going to be looking at the, at the promise of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to tell you that this message is not going to have a slant one way or the other on anyone's views of the gifts. When we travel around the world, we go into many kind of churches. Some of them are, would be extreme charismatic. Some of them are not charismatic at all. And, and you've got one group that says one thing about the other and the other group that says something about the other. We're not going there. We're, today we're just going to be looking at what the Bible says, and that's what we ought to do every day. But in Acts chapter 1, I'm just going to read a few verses, and I want you to know that this was written by Dr. Luke. Luke traveled with Paul. He was Paul's personal physician, and he said, The first account I composed, Theophilus, Theophilus was the benefactor of this trip. In other words, the book of Acts, to some degrees, is what we might call a prayer letter. It's Luke writing a letter telling Theophilus what's happening. I think that's kind of cool, don't you? Most of the Bible, or in the New Testament anyway, are letters that were written to individuals that got passed around. And look what happened here. He says, The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. That would be the book of Luke. He also wrote the book of Luke. It says, until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. Now look in verse 3. To these he also presented himself alive after his sufferings by many convincing proofs. They saw him. They touched him. They had interaction with him. They had meals with him. Jesus was dead and now he was alive. Appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. He's telling them what mattered. What mattered. Now in verse 4, this is where we're going to really pick it up. Gathering them together, He commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which He said, You heard from Me. When I initially planned on sharing these verses and these, these passages, I planned on starting here and doing the intro work in Acts chapter 1, then jumping over to Acts chapter 2 and talking about Pentecost and what happened. But then the Lord said, now, that was a good plan. That was a good plan, Craig, but I don't think that's what we're going to do. We're going to do Acts chapter 1, and then we're going to do Acts chapter 2 and hope we get through in that time. Because you see, there's so much right here that just gets kind of jumped over and read over. But I want to see a few things from Acts chapter 1, verse 4. The Bible says, Jesus gathered them together. Now, this should tell us something right off the bat. Who was it that was doing the gathering? It was Jesus. Do you know that Jesus is still doing that? He gathered them together, and then He did something. He said He commanded them. He commanded them. Or, but when He says uh, He commanded them not to leave, this sounds like it's a verb, but it's really not. It's a participle. A participle is a verb that's used like a noun or a pronoun, takes the place of a noun or a pronoun. And this is, this is a present tense, and it says, while continually commanding them, would be how this is translated, or once while having continually uh, commanding them, and it's a middle voice, that means he's doing this because he wanted to. He's telling them what he wants to tell them because he wants to. And here's what he said, not to depart from Jerusalem. He said, stay where you are. Now, if you'd been with Jesus off and on for 40 days after the resurrection, would you have big plans? You'd probably want to go tell everybody, wouldn't you? You'd probably want to start something. You might want to build a church. You might want to build a monument. You might want to do something because that's the way we're cut. We want to do something. But he said, just stay right here in Jerusalem. And then he said to do something that's very, very hard. Darwin, I know you. This is very hard for you. It's not hard for me because I'm different. <laughs> he told him to wait. Isn't that a hard thing to do? I'm, I'm joking. It is hard for me too. Waiting. That's one of the hardest things we do. Here's what I want you to do. Nothing. 
wait. Wait for the promise of the Father. Now, I want to say that waiting may be one of the hardest things that we're ever called to do. What if they'd gone and done something and got ahead of God, got ahead of the Holy Spirit? Wait for the promise of the Father. Now, this is a present tense verb. Let me tell you what that means. I want you to, as a lifestyle, as you are going, continually, continuous action, I want you to live a life of waiting on the Lord. It wasn't just for this one thing. This was as we're going, waiting on the promise of the Father. Now, there's no end to the waiting on the Father's promises. This doesn't end. And then he says in verse 4, he says, uh, commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which you heard from me. He said, folks, you heard it from me. Do you remember when Jesus was talking to His disciples over and over and over? He would tell them things that were going to happen and sometimes they didn't hear it or they didn't believe it. And even now, they might struggle with this. But He said, I just want you to wait. They don't understand. They don't know what's going on. Wait, because I've given you the promises. Earlier, He said, it's better that I go away because if I don't go away, the one who's going to come alongside, the Comforter, He won't come. Now, I want to say this, talking about the Holy Spirit. I've heard messages and I've heard people talk and they say that in Acts chapter 2 is when the Holy Spirit came. And I go, excuse me? Yeah, that's when the Holy Spirit came. He came at Pentecost. Well, we're not going to look at those passages today, but I want to tell you this. Acts chapter 2 is not when the Holy Spirit came. Because I want to tell you this about the Holy Spirit. He is God and He is omnipresent. That means He is every place at the same time. Before God created anything, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit were already one and yet they were three. This tri triune God. The Bible says once that the world was created and it was formless and void, the Bible says the Holy Spirit hovered over the face of the deep. He hovered. He was already here. The Holy Spirit is not coming. He's always been, but He's coming with power. Power that's going to be theirs permanently. Well, in verse 5, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. They don't understand this. They're hearing it. They know what the word baptizo means. It means to plunge under. It means to re plunge under by repeatedly dipping. They understand what the word means, but they don't understand what's about to happen. They don't understand this, but it says that you will be baptized. Okay? John did it with water, but now it's going to be with the Holy Spirit. Now this is a future indicative passive and you're going to say, so what? That is such a thrill. But I'm going to tell you what future means. When he says something, this is future tense. That means it will happen. It is in their future. There is no doubt about it. He said it. Passive voice means he's going to cause the action. Well, it's in their future. There is no doubt about it. And the passive voice, it says, they had nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it. Sometimes I hear people talk about, if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, or if you want to, be, uh, if you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, here's what you do. You ever heard anybody talk like that? You do this. Folks, I'm going to tell you, the disciples did nothing. Not only did they do nothing, they didn't know what to do, even if they wanted to do something. The only requirement for them was to wait. That was it. Wait. Do nothing. It's in the future. There is no doubt, and they have nothing to do with it. And it says baptized, and look what it says, uh, with the Holy Spirit. Now that could be translated in, or by, or with baptized by the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Spirit. We are in Christ and we are in the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is in us and we are one, not just with Him, 
but in Him. This is so much bigger deal than most people realize. Now, I want to tell you this baptism, again, is caused totally by the Holy Spirit. It has nothing to do with you. It in no way has anything to do with what you do or don't do. You say you can stop it. Really? You can stop God? I didn't know that. You can prevent? No. It has nothing to do with you. And it wasn't brought on. This baptism of the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Spirit, was not brought on, listen to this, by their actions, by their belief. Now this is the last one I want to, I want to really emphasize. Or by their faith. Their faith had nothing to do with what was about to take place. You say, they just need to believe. Folks, they didn't know what to believe. There wasn't an issue about believing or not believing right here. They had no clue about what was to come. This was all God. Well, I want to tell you this. Your faith, your faith, your faith has nothing to do with the blessings of God being given. Let that sink in a minute. Your faith, nobody in this room, nobody watching, wherever you're watching, your faith has nothing to do with the blessings of God being given. They had nothing to do with what was about to happen. It was initiated totally by the grace of God. And this baptism was a grace gift, and it was predicted by God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit from basically from all that Jesus was teaching them and even from the Old Testament. Now in verse 6, it says, So when they had come together, they were asking Him, saying, Lord, is it, in, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? Now isn't this just like people? He tells them to wait, do nothing. Something big's about to happen. You're about to be baptized with, in, or by the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, they want to make it about a thing about something that was about to happen. They wanted to know about times and epics of times. They wanted to know about earthly kingdoms and power. They were basically asking, Lord, is this when the Romans are going to be overthrown? Is this when the Romans are going to be out of Jerusalem and Israel and we're going to be once again our own king and rule our own country? They didn't have a clue. But I like the way that Jesus answered in verse 7. He said, it is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by His own authority. Bottom line, He said, you're not to even know about those things you want to know about. Times or epochs. You don't even need to know. Let me tell you what people struggle with. This, this bothers people when they ask me a question. A deep theological question that I may or may not know the answer to. Here's the bottom line. Today, I'm comfortable with saying this. I don't know. People will ask me a Bible question. Assume, assume that I'll be able to answer it. No, I know where it is in Scripture. And that's not to say that in the past I haven't answered it. But here's some things that I know about the Bible. There's some things about the Bible that I don't know. And there's some things about God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit that I don't know. But I do know this. I know the nature of of the triune God, the, the Trinity, I know that God is love. And so that everything that He does is based on that one thing, that He is love. And then people come back and say, well, what about? Have you ever heard of what about? Well, what about? What about this verse? Well, what about that? What about said, He said right there? Wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't understand all these things. I just know that God is love. Now, when I come upon a verse that, that troubles me, I'll say, Lord, I don't understand this. And he'll say, that's okay. I do. I understand it. I've got it taken care of. Just read on. Just continue to believe. And then sometimes he'll say, oh, by the way, let's talk about that verse you didn't understand. And it'll, it'll come to me. And the Lord will just speak to my heart, either through the Word or through my spirit. And he'll say, that's what that means. And I say, Lord, that is so simple. How did I miss that? He said, don't worry about it. I'm in control of this. I haven't missed it. And he'll show you. Well, we're going to get to 
verse 8, Acts 1 8, one of the most important verses in the Bible. He says, Some things you don't need to know. It is not for you to know the times and the epics the Father has fixed by His own authority. You don't need to know those things. And then he starts verse 8. It's the verse that people don't use the first word in. But. He said, all these other things that you want to know are fixed by the authority of God. Don't worry about it. But, ayah, strong contrast. You, here's what I want you to know. Here's what I do want you to know. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. Now we're going to talk about this verse a lot. I'm going to show you some things this verse said. I'm going to show you some facts that are given in Acts 1.8. Here's the first fact. He said, you will receive. Now this again is future tense. No doubt. It's set. I've already determined it. From eternity past, this has already been set. It will happen. You will receive. We'll talk about it in a minute. What we're going to receive. But he said you're going to receive something. And this is either a middle or a passive voice. Middle means you're going to receive it because I want you to receive it. God gives us what He gives us because He wants to. He gives you all that was His, David, because He wanted to. You don't deserve it. You ever heard that? Well, I know that too. But He's given it to you anyway, and it has nothing to do with you. You're going to receive it, and it has nothing to do with you. And it could be a passive voice, and that means somebody else causes it. You have nothing to do with it. There's no doubt about this. It's going to happen. And He's the one who causes it. And by the way, not only does He want it, but you're going to want it too. You're going to want it too. Our only part is not to do anything to receive this, although I believe we need to receive what God has given us. But our only part, listen to this, once we've received what He's given us, and, and He's already done it, and these words that we're playing around with and throwing around and don't understand them, here's the only thing. I want to walk in what has already been given. I want to walk in what is mine. Okay. Well, we see that you're going to receive something. Now let's talk about what will be received. What will be received that is beyond any doubt? And it says you will receive power. And the Greek word for that, and I actually wrote it out in Greek in my notes. If, I, if you had time, I'd just show you that I know how to write it out in Greek. How impressive is that? But the word is dunimas. Dunima, dunimis. Spelled it wrong. D. Well, anyway. Dunimis. Is, it's not dunimas. That's what I used to say, but it's dunimis. And what it means is, it means power, but it's the word we get the word dynamite from. Power. The word dynamite comes from this. This is explosive power. This is power that's going to change the world. This is God's power. Now, in an even bigger way than dynamite changed the world as we know it, this power will change the world in a much bigger way than that. In the 1800s, a guy by the name of Nobel invented dynamite. Before dynamite was invented, there was there were explosives. There was black powder, which is really not all that powerful and explosive. But then they came up with this thing called nitroglycerin. Nitro. Man, you could blow rocks up with that. You could blow a building down. You could blow yourself up. And that's what they did a lot of times with nitroglycerin. Because if you bumped it or if you dropped it, you and all your buddies close to you are going to be gone. Because it's highly unstable. Even though it had great power, it was very unstable. And then this stuff called dynamite came along. And they would mix uh, nitroglycerin with packing of some kind, and they would compact it together. And you could drop it. You could cut it. I guess you could eat it if you wanted to. I don't recommend it. But it was power under control, and the Industrial Revolution was born about the same time dynamite 
came into existence. And the guy Nobel, he became one of the wealthiest men in the world. And today, they give some prizes out called the Nobel Prizes. And they give lots of money. And it started from this. Well, just like dynamite changed the world, the power that these disciples were about to receive was far greater than that. He says, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Well, I want to say this. When the Holy Spirit has come. I want to talk about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a genitive of possession. It owns the power. Not it. He owns the power that these folks are about to receive. He is the possessor of the power that He's going to give. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now, this is an aorist participle, and what that means, it's completed action. This is going to be a one-time thing. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, it's a one-time thing, and it's a, it's a verb that's used like a noun. The Holy Spirit, once having come upon you, and he says it's like the days of old. When this, I'm sorry, this is not like the days of old, when the Holy Spirit would come upon someone, and He would empower them for a specific task, and then the power would be gone. Now, I want to say this, and this is a can of worms that I don't want to chase today, but the Holy Spirit didn't show up in their lives here. The Holy Spirit showed up in power here. The Bible says that one of the evidences of the fact that you are in Christ is that you have been sealed in the Holy Spirit. Sealed. So, for people to be in Christ, Old Testament and New Testament believers, the sealing of the Holy Spirit took place. So, it's not an issue of even if the Holy Spirit shows up in somebody's life before this time. That's another thing. If we had more time, I'd go into that. And I can base, back that up with Scripture. But that's not what this is about. We're talking about power here. The power is going to be available as an ongoing lifestyle right here. It's not like the days of old when the Holy Spirit, the power of the Spirit would come and He would go. This power given, listen, does not depart. You say people sometimes they'll pray, Oh Lord, give me the power to do this. Bad prayer. Why is that a bad prayer? What? He already has done this. Now, do we walk in what has been given to us? Sometimes we don't. See, this issue is not for me to do something so that I'll have power. This issue is for me to walk in who I am and what I have been given. This issue is not whether the believer has the power. He does have the power. The issue is will he walk in it. And folks, this applies to all of us. Now the result of receiving the power doesn't say here that you will do great things. doesn't say anything about what you're going to do right here. Doesn't mean you're going to do great stuff. Doesn't mean you're going to remove tall buildings or leap over tall buildings with a single bound. Sounds like Superman, doesn't it? Doesn't mean this. You know, the world may look at you and think you're just a normal person. But folks, a normal person that understands his identity in Christ and understands what it is that Christ has done and who it is that literally he is in. This is not a statement about doing this is a statement of being. This statement about receiving this power speaks to identity and not activity. You say, if you've got the power, you already use it. You will. You will. But this is speaking about identity. Again, this is future. There's no doubt about it. It's, it's going to happen. You shall be. You shall be. It says baptized. No question about it. Because He wants you to be and because you want to be. I want to. He wants to. Because God is going to cause it. And then He says, you shall be my witnesses. Now, in the English, when we have the preposition my, it shows possession. But there is no preposition my right there. But there is a pronoun. There's no preposition at all in the Greek. There's a pronoun and the pronoun is I. So what this would translate, it would be, you shall be an I witness. Not E-Y-E, -E, but the letter I witness. In other words, when they see you, they're going to be seeing me. 
Do you see that? When they see you, they see me. And the word witness. We think of the word witness. I, I was, had jury duty this past week. And a juror, he, uh, he would listen to somebody talk about what he has seen and knows. An eyewitness. E-Y-E. Witness. That means he's telling what he saw. Folks, this is not what this word means. The word witness is the transliteration of the Greek word. And the Greek word is the same as the English. And it's the same as the Spanish. And the word is martyr. You shall be and I martyr. You will be like me and that when I died, you died. Just dying is not that big a deal. Everybody can do that. But you see, this isn't just about the death. This is also about the burial and the resurrection. You're going to have power. What kind of power? Holy Spirit power. What kind of power is that? God power. And you're going to be the God man that died. When Christ died, you died. When He was buried, and you were buried. And when He was raised, you were raised to walk in newness of life. That's what this word means. You're going to be like me. I died, you died. I was buried, you were buried. I was raised, you will be raised. And this is not what you do or say. It is who you are. Again, this is about identity. Well, it doesn't say it doesn't say where anything will get done or where this is going to take place. They don't know any of this. They don't know anything. They're just to wait. Well, where this identity will be manifested. He tells them that where this identity is going to be manifested, where this picture of the death, burial, and the resurrection of you is going to take place. It says in Jerusalem. Where were they? They were in Jerusalem. I hear people talking sometimes about mission trips. I had a guy ask me, or a lady asked me one time, I was at a church down in Louisiana, and they wanted me to come to that church, and after a few minutes I realized that I wasn't going to go to that church. And so I was having fun with them. And this one lady asked me, she says, what do you think? And it was, I'm asking it the way she asked me. What do you think about mission trips? She asked me like that. <laughs> and I thought, well, what do you expect me to say? I'm against it. And so here's what I did answer her. And I was a young guy. I probably shouldn't have done it this way. But what I answered was what I thought. And I think I was right. I said, most people like you that are interested in mission trips want to do that so they don't have to go across the street and talk to the neighbor that they don't care about. Next question. It's amazing the questions dried up pretty quick. You say, should I have done that? I don't know. I was having fun with her. But the fact of the matter is, he said it's going to start in Jerusalem. You know where your mission field is? Where you are. Right where you are. Jerusalem, the city they're in. Then he says, all Judea. Now Jerusalem was in Judea. Judea, the region that they were in and the region that they moved about in. You're going to be an eye martyr. You're going to be the same kind of dead person that I am in Jerusalem and in all Judea. And then he mentioned Samaria. Now Samaria was an area that was north of Judea. It was between Galilee and, and Judea at the bottom. And Samaria, those folks, oh my goodness, they were half-breeds. They were part Greek and they were part Jew. And the Jews had nothing to do with the Samaritans. And he says, but you're going to be the witness that looks like me in the death, the burial, and the resurrection in Samaria, the re region that borders where you are. Now, this is not an area they traveled in or through in, at that time at all. Then he goes on to say, the remotest part of the earth. The remotest part of the earth. And I say, What's the significance here? Part is singular. Sometimes people become so grandiose, they want to do such big things, quote unquote, they lose sight of the fact that God wants you to be who you are wherever you are. If you're at the grocery store, you be who you are. If you're at the house with the grandkids, you be who you are. If you're in a pulpit speaking to a thousand people or more, you be who you are. Be who you are where you are. Now you can only be one place at a time. And what he's saying here is wherever you are, you will be appropriating my resurrection power. 
You see, if you just stayed dead, there's nothing there. But because of the resurrection, the power that I have, the power that raised me, the Holy Spirit power that raised me is yours. The power of the death, the burial, and the resurrection. The power of the Holy Spirit leads you to being a martyr. Now, that doesn't mean you say, well, I'm going to die then. I'm just going to die. Here's the good news. You don't even have to do that. The Bible says you have died. When Christ died, you died. That's not even about you. None of this is your part. Well, after he had said these things, the Bible says, look in verse 9. After he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. After he said these things, he was finished. This would be translated because it's a participle, an heiress participle, which is completed action. Once having said these things, wow, done, finished. He was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Once having spoken, while they were speaking, he finished. And it says, and, and look at this. He was lifted up while they were looking on. And this means while they were continually seeing him. They were looking at him. They were beholding him. They were fixing their gaze on him. And all of a sudden, up he goes. And, and it says he was lifted up. And this literally means to be taken up. To be taken up. Someone has caused this action. It was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They were all in on this. But I believe it was the Holy Spirit power that lifted him up. This means to lift up or to raise on high. And I like this one, this part. This means to be lifted up with pride. To be lifted up with pride. God the Father is elevating the Son. Now, He could have taken Him, just, He could have just been gone and be in the presence of heaven, of the Father there. He could have done that, but He didn't. He let them see Him be lifted up, to be lifted up with pride. The pride was the pride of heaven for Christ the Son. They were lifting Him up. Now, this is what a point I want to make right here. This is the same way that we will be lifted up. Exactly the same. With the same pride of heaven for you and you as they had for God the Son. They feel exactly, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, feel exactly the same about you as they do God the Son. The Bible says you shall be lifted up you will be lifted up on high just like Jesus. Some people say, are you saying we're God? No, I'm not saying that. But I am saying this, you're the Son of God, you're the daughter of God, and He feels about you exactly like He does God the Son. God the Father feels about us like we can't even imagine. And I, I was thinking about this, and, and the closest thing that I can think of it's when Christ was lifted up and when we will be lifted up. It's like when a team lifts up a hero on their shoulders. Have you all seen somebody will make a play and they'll win or they'll do something great and they'll put them up on their shoulders and they'll walk out with them on their shoulders? Sometimes they'll lift the coach up. Why are they doing that? Because they love Him and they want to exalt Him. The Bible says, humble yourself before the Lord and He will exalt you lift you up. How do you humble yourself before the Lord? It's by walking in total dependence on Him. Then the Bible says, a cloud received Him. Received. One time. Finished. Done. Completed action. A cloud received Him. Now I want to talk about this. Christ died. Christ was buried. Christ was raised. What did He do? Look in, look in verse 9. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And it was all that he came to do was accomplished. So what did he do? Died, buried, raised. Pretty much it. Well, you say he trained a lot of men. He trained 11. Spent time with a few women. But what he did do was he became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. 
Now that's a really big thing. If people talk about all the things that Christ did, most times they're going to talk about the miracles they see, raising the dead, causing the deaf to, to hear and the blind to see and the dumb to speak. And those are wonderful things. But that isn't the big deal. The big deal is the fact that He died and was buried and was raised and has given you His life and became sin so that you could become His righteousness. He was finished. And the Bible says He was received into a cloud. And, and I used to think, okay, He went up into the clouds. Except it's much bigger than that. This word cloud that's used right here is exactly the same Greek word that was used in what we call the Septuagint which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. They had the Septuagint for many, many years before they had the New Testament. And they put the, put the Old Testament in Koine Greek, so that the language of the people, so that they would be able to read the Scriptures for themselves. And this word cloud right here is the same word that was used to describe the cloud that led the children of Israel by day. You see, this is the cloud. This is literally God leading the children of Israel. Basically, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, received God the Son back. This is the cloud we're talking about. It didn't just go out of our sight. It wasn't just like you couldn't see Him anymore. It was like He was received back where He's been from eternity. Now here's the great news. Out of their sight. This does not mean separation. This just means we can no longer physically just see who it is that's with us. We can't see the Holy Spirit. We can't see the fact that we are presently co-seated in Him on His throne. But the facts are still the facts. You are in Christ. You are seated in Him on His throne. Separated from sight, but not separated from Him. Now next week we're going to be talking about Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. I would suggest that you read it. Don't read it believing what you've always heard. Say, Lord, show me what you're telling me right here and read Acts chapter 2. I think you'll be very, very excited about it. And we're going to talk about it. It was foretold by Jesus and others. And next week we're going to see it. But Acts chapter 1 is pretty good. So uh, I don't have anything else to share with you this week. I'm just going to tell you all that was His is yours. He's already shown us these things. And so, we'll see you next time.